that we are going we, every day that we are being sanctified to become holy, to be salt and light on the earth. Our firm foundation is in Christ. So we thank you, Jesus, for you are our hope. We thank you, Holy Spirit.
every day would be open for something new, Lord God, more of you, Lord God. So today, I encourage you to really take in the Word. Allow the Word to transform our lives. That the Word is a Word of refreshment, new, every day. God has so much for us. So much for us. So that He can be glorified for the salvation of souls. That we be the salt and the light upon this earth. This is our desire. So that many, many will come to know God. Mark said last week, who do people say that Jesus is? Well, I ask, who do you say that you are? We are the children of God. Amen? Amen. Giving honour and glory to God in everything that we do for others. For those that are blinded. Those that are dormant. Those that are asleep in Christ may be woken. And we have a helper, and that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us. And this is who we are. We are disciples upon this earth to go forth, to proclaim the Word, and to proclaim the goodness of God, what Jesus done for us on the cross. Amen? Amen. So we are children of God. Amen? Let the Word today penetrate through our hearts, and may our ears be open. Amen. All honour and glory to our awesome God. We've just sung those words. I choose to be holy, set apart for you. You want to do the Lord's will? Part of his will is for us to share around the Lord's table today. You know, the uh, communion was first established by Jesus when he was celebrating the Jewish Passover feast with his disciples. The Passover meal celebrates how God passed over the Jewish homes and spared them from the death of the firstborn. Yes. And it also celebrates them, God's leading out of slavery in Egypt. It was at this meal that Jesus changed the meaning of the Last Supper as it relates to believers in him. For the Jews of today, they still follow God's command to eat the meal every year in celebration of his leading their ancestors out of slavery. But Jesus is telling all Christians to eat this meal in remembrance of him and what he has done for us. And ever since then, Christians has, have observed this meal. The early Christians met secretly in people's homes to remember the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And since then, the church has been celebrating what we call the communion service. I'm going to look at some scripture now. It's probably quite familiar to you. We read it most weeks. But I just want to reflect on that a little bit more today as uh, we prepare ourselves for sharing in the Lord's Supper. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and those verses from 23 to 30. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27. So then when whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of Christ. Everybody ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Verse 29 says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ 
eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. These words come from the Apostle Paul, sharing what, as he said, he learnt from Jesus Christ himself. I think that communion too often is uh, looked at in the church as just being something we do. I hope today that it's not just something that you do. In reality, it's an opportunity for Christians to worship Jesus by remembering the sacrifice that he was willing to make for our sakes. But like all other memories, we cannot remember if we don't have a personal experience or involvement in a situation. For example, you can't remember the first time I ever rode a horse because you were not involved. All you could do would be hear about me telling you the story of me riding a horse. In the same way, unless we are personally invested in the thing we are trying to remember, all we can do is hear about people's memories of it. At the Last Supper, all the disciples were sitting around the table with Jesus. And at that first meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread and offered a prayer of thanksgiving to God the Father for that bread. Then he took a piece of the bread and passed it to the rest of the disciples. In verses 24 and 25, Jesus told us that the bread and the cup represent his body. Just as his body was broken and drained for our sakes, the bread is broken and the cup is drained at the meal. And we are called to remember that each time we partake of these emblems. But if we haven't given ourselves over to Jesus and taken him as our saviour and have no relationship with him, therefore we have no memories of what he has done for us. Does that make sense? We cannot remember what we have never experienced. So just as you can't remember that first time I ever rode a horse because you were not there to experience it, all you're able to do is hear about it. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will not be able to remember anything that he went through for your sake. But the idea of remembering is more than just recalling an event that once took place. It's the stirring of the mind to relive with Jesus Christ as much of his life, death and resurrection as humanly possible. Each time we observe this supper, we must remember how holy it is and what place it takes in our very salvation. And the reason that we've come here together today to church in the first place. It's a time honouring and for his sacrifice for us. Verse 26 tells us that as we do these things, we are proclaiming to ourselves and to others the fact that Jesus died for us and promised to come back for us. So what do we remember? We remember what God's word says about Jesus. We remember that he left heaven to be born in a human body, we remember that he came poor so that we might be rich. We remember that he bore our sins on his very own body on the tree of Calvary. We remember that he shed his blood for our redemption. And we remember that he conquered death forever for us. And he ascended, ascended back to heaven to the Father. Communion is also a time of self-reflection. Verses 27 and 28 give us a clear warning about how we are to partake of this meal. We must ensure that our hearts have nothing in them that would distract our focus away from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told that if we eat this meal in a manner that's not worthy of Jesus, we are pur purposely sinning against him. 
That's why Christians should never take the emblems if they have something on their hearts, such as unforgiveness. If you have something on your heart today, such as negative feelings towards someone for something, you need to deal with that before you partake. It may even mean that you shouldn't take communion this morning. And if that's the case, there's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's everything godly to do until your heart is clear of any such sin. And communion is a time of personal declaration. It's possible for a lost person to partake of the Lord's Supper and never be saved. This event in itself has no saving power. However, for those who are saved, it's a time for us to declare publicly that we believe in his death and his resurrection and that they were for us. So let's take our stand this morning with the redeemed and proclaim loudly our faith in him and our dependence on his sacrifice. The Lord's Supper is a prime time to identify yourself with the Lord Jesus. If you wish to partake this morning, I invite you to come and take a piece of bread and a cup and take them back to your seats. In verse 24 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Jesus said, This bread represents my body, which is being given for you. When you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let's just pause for a moment, remember Jesus, and then eat together. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for this bread that reminds us of your broken body given for us, that you died and took your sin, our sin upon you, sorry. You were sinless, the only person who ever walked without sin. And we just thank you, Jesus. We remember what you have done for us all the times that we have come to you, we remember those now. And we just thank you. Thank you for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just eat. And in verse 25, Jesus continued by saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by his shed blood. Each time that you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. That's Jesus. Let's drink together, remembering the new covenant we have with God because of Jesus' death on the cross. Just give thanks once again. Continue to give thanks to Jesus. Give thanks to God for the new relationship that we can have with him because of Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you gave us your one and only Son so that if we believe and trust in him, we have everlasting life with you. And we give thanks for that today. We give thanks for the victory over death that we, Jesus came to show. We thank you that he not only rose from the dead, but he ascended to you and is now with you at the right hand, at your right hand. We give you thanks and celebrate that today. And we look forward to the time when we are able to share this afresh in your presence and in the presence of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you are sending Jesus back to reclaim his people. And we look forward to that day. Thank you, Father.
Jesus' precious name. Amen. We are progressing through the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, last time I spoke about uh, Noah in chapter 6 to 8. The corruption of mankind, the great global flood judgment, then the flood subsides and Noah delivered. Noah's deliverance. Hebrews 11, 6 and 7 beautifully captures about Noah's faith journey. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became the an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah means comfort, a rest. Grace of God that saved Noah and his family from judgment. Grace means unmerited favor. In fact, Jesus Christ mentioned Noah and the flood in his Mount of Olives Q&A session with his disciples about his second coming. Let me read Matthew 26, 37, 36 and 37 and 42. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. As, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. At today's message, we are going to look at the chapter 9 in Genesis under the title, God's Covenant with Noah and all the creation. Let us pray. Grace, Heavenly Father, may the words I speak today and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let it be bringing benefit and encouragement to all those who are listening and draw them closer with the Holy Spirit, divine help, to abide in your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So in Genesis chapter 9, 1 to 7, I'm reading from ESV, English Standard Version. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. And for your Life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by men shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful, fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, and multiply in it. So the first seven verses, God gives five commands as we just read the first seven verses. The first one is be fruitful and fill the earth. God repeated what was given to Adam and Eve, emphasizing his priority and plan for marriage, family, and society. The second one is rule over the animals. But it's changed, actually. Changed from a loving supremacy and shepherding, changed into replaced by fear and dread. The third one is permission to eat meat. So before the flood, people eat only plants-related ones, not the meat. But it's allowed to eat after the flood. 
The fourth one is refrain from eating blood. In scripture, blood represents life, the gift of God that requires proper respect. Then the fifth one is capital punishment. God declares justice against murder by establishing human government. If you read the pre-flood, people were wicked and murdering each other and so on, which is happening right now as well. But the thing is, that's why the government has been established to, to control that. Any new situation in life, such as a new job, new city, new relationship, I may add the new virus which we're just facing, that require ad adjustment to the new normal, right? Noah and his family found themselves the only survivor of the global flood the world has ever seen, faced with unfamiliar new normal with changed environment. The real climate change started from the global flood, after the global flood. Changed landscape, changed diet, eating meat and so on. And the human government and capital punishment started as well, as scripture says. Let me read a few, few scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 13, 14. This is about submitting to that authority. Be subject to the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it is to be the emperor or as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Romans 13, 1 to 7, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will inherit judgment. For rulers are not a terror uh, to good contact, but to bad. Would you, have to, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities, our ministers of God, attending to the very thing. Pay to all that is own to them, taxes to whom the taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So this reading which I just read talks about the government which we all have in, in the democratic countries. Matthew 26, 52, then Jesus said to him, that is to Peter, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Bible also urges to do good, pray for all people and obey God. Titus 3, 1 says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. First Timothy 2, 1 to 4 also talks about we should pray for our leaders as well. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and di uh, dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In our life group on Thursday, we discussed the power of tongue in James chapter 3, 8, and 9. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So this gives a clear warning about what we see, what we talk is really important too. 
Acts 5.29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. When it comes to obeying things, obviously the first one is we have to obey God because everything belongs to God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's have a quick look at what has happened post-flood changes in the world and the earth. The thermal blanket has gone. There is a canopy theory of atmospheric water sh shield protected the earth from cosmic radiation, hence longer lifespan prior to the flood. Because there was a water ball canopy theory. That's a theory, obviously. Then the second, uh, that is also supported by the hydro plate theory. The flood due to the 40 days of rain, also the fountains of the deep raised and prevailed for 150 days. The Bible also talks about that. The water came from underneath and also from above to fill the whole global flood. So the atmospheric pressure has been reduced to 50% as well after the um, global flood. The end of universal climate that brings the, the climate change started from then and it's moving, deteriorating from then on. Extended longevities now decline. So people lived in their hundreds. You probably know the, the, the longest living lived person recorded in the Bible was 969 years, Methuselah. So now you can see people live in the tents. If they are healthy, they will probably live 70, 80, maybe 90. And there is a maximum put on in the Bible, it's written as well, it says 120 years after the flood. Then also the more oceans and less land has happened after the global flood as well. So then obviously before that there's no rain, there's rain after that. That brings the next topic, which is the rainbow. Um, rainbow was God's sign for peace with him. Let me read Genesis 9, 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a food a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creatures of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is on the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and ever, uh, every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. As Noah faced the new normal, God reassured him of his unfailing love by establishing a covenant with Noah and humanity. It's interesting to count seven times word covenant mentioned in this Genesis chapter nine. And the colors of the rainbow is also seven colors. There's something interesting. The color of the rainbow, the acronym we used to learn in the school, V-I-B-G-Y-O-R, V-I-B-G-R we used to call that, in the color order, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. God gave the rainbow a special meaning for Noah's descendants, including us. We usually see only half of the rainbow in the clouds, right? However, the prophet Ezekiel in 
chapter 128 and the apostle John in Revelation 4, 3 saw the full circle of the rainbow in their vis visions of God's glory. When we see God face to face, we will behold the full circle of glory in his person and work. Ezekiel 1.28 Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on, on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. And I heard the voice of one speaking. Similar thing it said in Revelation 4.3 as well. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and uh, clumline, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So, Psalm 107, 42 and 43, the upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to those things, let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Covenants usually has a physical sign as a reminder of the promise. The Noahic covenant, God will never again destroy the earth and all life with a global flood. The unconditional covenant does not depend on people's obedience for its fulfillment. God will fulfill the covenant because he is faithful to his word a source of comfort and hope for all creation. God designed the rainbow as a sign of Noah covenant. Similar to what we do humanly when we have the wedding covenant, we have the ring placed on, isn't it, most of the culture. That, that's a covenant too in, in the human perspective. Every covenant has a sign. It's another example is Luke 22, the large table covenant um, and sign. As Brother Mark she had communion today. Um, another passage in the Matthew which talks about the blood of the covenant. Mark quoted from the, the first Corinthians on the new covenant. Here in the Matthew 26, 28 to 29, it says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the wine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that's one of the things we are looking forward as well. So that is the covenant, that's the blood covenant we partake when we partake the communion, um, Jesus. Let us continue with the Genesis chapter 9. Noah's uh, descendants, uh, the, the verses 18 and 19, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole world were dispersed. God offered Noah and his family a fresh start after the global flood. God promised he would fill the whole earth through Noah's three sons. The next verses talks about Noah's sin. That's from verses 20 to 23. Um, Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay un uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told to his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Wicked humans wiped out at the global flood, but not the sin. One proof of the Bible's <clears throat> trustfulness is that it exposes the flaws of the sins of the human heroes, too. Noah drank wine from his vineyard and became drunk. To the point he became incapacitated. He lay naked in his tent. Even righteous and blameless people like Noah do foolish things. But God is so gracious 
that he calls us to repentance so that we might want more enjoy the fullness of the relationship with him and his blessing wine fermentation is a natural uh, it's a natural process but drunkenness condemned in various scriptures as sin along with other sins in the old testament isaiah 5 11 and 22 uh, let me read woe to those who rise up early in the morning that they may run after a strong drink who tarry late into evening as wine inflames them woe to those who are heroes of uh, at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink paul also warns about various sins including drunkenness in galatians chapter 5 19 to 21 now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalries uh, dissensions divisions envy drunkenness orgies and things like this so you mentioned many many things covered here including drunkenness i warn you as i warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of god so there's a strong warning there but the fruit, uh, fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires so paul also has similar quoted in ephesians 5:15 and 18 look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil therefore do not be foolish but understand that understand what the will of the lord is and do not get drunk with wine but for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to god the father in the name of our lord jesus christ submitting one another out of reverence for christ so this particular chapter clearly talks about how we should walk um and also be filled with the spirit rather than drunk get drunk noah sin did not require a talking serpent his sin rose from within his own sinful nature because god is perfect he can use imperfect people as part of his plan sadly public scandals involving pastors and well known christian leaders occur frequently you can probably watch them in the tv sometimes faith never matures as past our need to depend on god's mercy and to stay on god against sin the first corinthians chapter 10 12 and 13 offers a need needed warning to all of us therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man god is faithful and he is he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be also to endure it so if you think you are standing firm be careful that you don't fall ham saw his father's nakedness and rather than protecting him he told his two brothers is a sort of a form of a gossip shame and japeth chose the honorable response of refusing to speak of their father's embarrassing exposure they entered the tent backwards to avoid 
dishonoring Noah and covered his nakedness. This illustrates the, true, the truth. Love does not delight in evil. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 6 says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. The sins of others can make us feel self-righteous sometimes and superior if we do not honestly assess our own weaknesses. Only God's grace keeps us from sin. When you understand the grace God extends to you, the question is, do you freely offer grace to others as well? When we say the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as forgive those who sin against us. So that actually covers this aspect here as well. Noah's prophecy is regarding his three sons. The next part of this chapter 9 is from verse 24 to 29. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son has done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan. Um, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of shame, and let Canaan, let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of shame and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Noah was a great true, true prophet, and for 120 years, he warned the wicked people before the global flood, uh, and judgment is coming. He, he warned them and foretold them, and it happened as it, he told. He also prophesied about his three sons and their generations. Here, may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of shame, and may Canaan be his servant. God willing, let us check about these prophecies in the next chapters of Genesis in my next message. The question is, is the Noahic covenant binding today? Yes, it is. All generations have witnessed the rainbow God sets in place to comfort and warn sinners. God patiently shows grace and mercy until his day of the final judgment comes. On the day, his judgment will fall on those who have lived in opposition to him and his commands. When rainbow appears, those who trust God can rejoice. I remember, brother, Wayne was sharing the other day and he saw a rainbow a month ago. And uh, I also, whenever I see a rainbow, and Nimi took a photo, I think the photo which came there, taken by uh, Nimi. Um, yeah, God's patience, mercy, and grace being comfort to those who, who know, love, and trust him. Believers like live by faith in God's faithfulness. In concluding this message, there was no rain before the global flood and the rainbow is associated with rain, obviously. The bow represents battle bow. The battle between good or evil. Believing truth versus believing lie. John 3, 36, humans' sorry state and the way to escape has been mentioned there. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son, of, Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Noah trusted, waited, obeyed, and praised God into a changed world, a new normal. He also worshipped God by building an altar, declaring that the earth and everything in it belonged to the Lord. The global flood cleanses the earth from wicked people, but did not remove the sin, sinful nature, bond within every human. 
Jesus Christ is the only person ever lived in this world who is from heaven, was the perfect, blameless man ever lived. In Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Noah had faith even without full sight of God's plan for redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Now we know that Jesus Christ, the son of God and son of man came to earth, lived a righteous life and died in our place for our sin. He's resurrected from the dead and will return as king forever. God keeps his promises. Every promises in God's word will be fulfilled someday, even if we do not experience the complete fulfillment now. Second Corinthians 1, 20 and 22 says, for all the promise of God find their yes in him, and that is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. It's all yes and amen. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and gives us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and also as a guarantee God's word gives to us as well. So the question is, what is your greatest need today? What promise will you believe as you surrender your need to God and trust his timing to bring it to pass? Does your faith echo yes and amen to the specific promise in God's word? So we sang today about uh, yes, I worship and thank God and the cornerstone song which we sang as well. Your prospects are bright because God's promise are true. Important question to all in the auditorium and all watching later online, MCC YouTube channel, you can watch some later as well. Have you accepted God's grace of salvation through Jesus Christ? So we sang today about rise up like an eagle. So to see face to face Jesus, if you want to be part of that, meeting Jesus face to face, you have to make a choice and choose Jesus and believe him as your personal savior. If you haven't accepted Jesus before, please do not delay and accept God's love and grace now as written in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You may say a prayer like this, confessing to God that I am a sinner and believing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross and was raised from my justification. I do now receive and confess him as my personal savior. Amen. Once you said the prayer from your heart, you have the assurance of salvation and eternal life. Never doubt it. Keep trusting, obeying, and following Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture which we are going to read it gives us the double grip of grace. John 10, 27 to 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So this double grip of grace with is clearly assures us the salvation. So that's why you don't need to doubt it when you, when you see and accept Jesus from your heart. Once you became a born again believer, and receive the free gift of eternal life, you can also share the good news to your family and friends 
and also to anybody who comes across in your life as well, so that they may be also saved from the coming wrath and judgment and receive God's grace. Praise the Lord Jesus. If you have any prayer request or if you want to know more about what I said, you can come and talk to me as well. Please feel free to talk to us after the service. And if you need any prayer, you, can, you may also send a text to the church. We, a group of people, we normally pray on Wednesday uh, as a corporate prayer. If you have any prayer request, please send it to us as well. We'll love to pray for you too. Let me close in a word of prayer. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Genesis and for your covenant given to Noah and to us, the humanity. As we see the rainbow covenant in our lives that keep reminding us about your true promises, love and eternal grace. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for indwelling in us and helping us with your divine power. We pray that we commit ourselves to follow you, Lord Jesus, deeply rooted and established in faith to serve you with thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you.